Hello there. Hello. How are you? I'm doing well. How are you? I'm great. Good. Now Thank you so much for joining. Recovering. Um, oh. I, I I'm in the morning phase where I it hurts more than I expected. <laughs> it's been a week, but it's it's not fun. No. It's not fun. No, it's you got fun. another week or so, and then yeah, we'll I hope pass so. over the edge then. Yeah, I hope so. Okay, so I'm gonna start for the top because this is gonna be recorded for. I'm gonna use this for my podcast. So. Great. Thanks for joining us. We are being joined today by Jenny Gablesberg. She is a pelvic floor physical therapist and has her account here or on Instagram at Empowered Mama Scribe. So thank you for joining us. Sure. Uh, this is a very, very topic that's a topic that's very near and dear to my heart. I, I know most people wouldn't think that an MFM is so obsessed with pelvic floor PT, but I, I, I am a little. I have to admit. <laughs> uh, I think and I'll just give you a couple reasons why. Uh, the first is because I was pregnant one time with twins. I carried them to 31 weeks, and I still have some issues. I've noticed that my the way I urinate, my abdominal muscles, they're not quite what they were. Right. And I think, you know, I'm starting to get into where I'm trying to address that, but it's been almost five years, but it would have been nice had I done that earlier. Um, and then also, I'll give you a patient experience. Um, I remember very, very clearly, uh, this patient could barely walk. She literally had to have help. And I know there was a lot of eye rolls and you think, oh, she's, you know, she just wants to be delivered. And that's a common because of the pain, you know, oh, they just want to be delivered. But this was beyond that. I mean, it, it was literally very painful. And I think sometimes when we, we see them and you, there's not a test you can run, a certain thing that's physically on them that you can use to diagnose, you know, we kind of dismiss it as, oh, it's just pregnancy. Yeah, you know, and I remember that very clearly. Like, clearly, she had pelvic girdle issues and some, maybe some stuff of the pubis uh, issues going on. But it was—I remember that patient to this day. So, and I, oftentimes, women are just told, "We'll just deal yes. with it, and it'll all go away once and you have a baby," which is not yeah. what we want to hear as well. Yeah, I mean, it and it may get better, but it may not go away, or it may not get better. So, you know, after seeing that patient, I realized the significance of having pelvic girdle pain and and super uh, pubic pain. And then also, OBGYNs, I don't know why we're so resistant to it. And we shouldn't be. Um, it's not a hard thing to do to refer somebody or suggest it to somebody. So let's start with that. Why do you think we're so resistant to pelvic floor physical therapy for our patients? Yeah, well, I think oftentimes our OBs and even our urology colleagues, our mm -hmm. colorectal colleagues, mm -hmm. they're not really taught what we do, where yeah. an orthopedic surgeon during their training get a lecture on like, what is physical therapy? What is e-stem and ultrasound and ionto mm -hmm. and the things that more orthopedic um, physical therapists use, but there isn't that training um, mm -hmm. per se in the fields like OBGYN or Eurogyne. Um, I think the other part of that is there are at least 80,000 orthopedic PTs in the country. Yeah. And yeah. there are so few pelvic health physical therapists that, and we're so busy treating yeah. that oftentimes we don't have time to go out and be reaching out to our yeah. medical colleagues as well. Yeah, and that makes sense. I mean, I I don't remember ever hearing about pelvic floor health yeah. uh, physical therapists when I was training. I'm hearing, hearing more about it now, which is why I'm educating on it so much. So it's relatively new. And now you guys can actually explain. So how does someone first become a physical therapist and then go on to be a pelvic health or pelvic floor physical therapist? Explain that training. So it does make me laugh a little bit that mm -hmm. you said that it was new. <laughs> because... No, I mean, I, I mean, it's not no physical therapy, but yeah. hearing about pelvic floor physical therapy specifically, I mean, I really haven't ever heard of that until within the past three to four years. And yeah. that might just be my own ignorance, um, but I know I'm not the only one, so... So I've been educate me. Yeah, educate yeah, me. Yeah, I've been practicing in pelvic floor for 24 years yeah, okay. and have had a physical therapy clinic for 20 years that okay. all we do is pelvic health. Okay. So um, I'm sorry. So the question was, how do you become a pelvic yeah, health so what's, therapist? What's the training? Yeah. yeah. And then also you can add on to that how someone seeks out someone specifically for pelvic floor. 
Yeah, perfect. Yeah. Um, so in general, to become a physical therapist, you first have to do an undergraduate degree in something like biology or kinesiology, something in the, the medical realm. And then um, we all have to have a doctorate in physical therapy. So it is another three mm -hmm. years of education. And it, some of that is didactic training. Some of mm -hmm. that is clinical internships. But when you finish that, you most therapists are more of what we think of most commonly as an orthopedic physical therapist. You could go into neuro or pediatrics or acute care, but ortho is a majority of our training. Probably 10% of schools have a little bit of pelvic floor. I, 27 years ago, got one lecture, one two hour lecture on changes related to pregnancy. I didn't even know public health was a specialty when I graduated you know, eons ago. Now there are some schools that at least like have an elective where it's two hours once a week for, you know, maybe 10 weeks. Usually they're not teaching internal exams like we mm. would in a continuing education course. Mm. So if you really want to become a public health specialist, once you are licensed, actually, let me back that up. During school, in one of the three internships, um, students can decide to uh, specialize in public health. So like mm -hmm. right now we have a local Los Angeles um, University student mm -hmm. who is in with us for a 12 week rotation. And we love that because mm -hmm. now we can yeah. really um, very objectively guide their mm -hmm. trainings. But after graduation, if somebody's not had an internship, then they're looking at going to continuing education courses. Those usually look like three days at a time, um, multiple progressions of courses where we learn how to do internal pelvic floor mm -hmm. muscle um, examinations and treatments, whether that is a vaginal route or rectal route. We use biofeedback training. We look at kind of further up into the core what types of functional tests are done. So basically, we really focus on treating things like bowel and bladder problems, urinary incontinence, uh, fecal incontinence, pelvic organ prolapse, mm -hmm. anything in that pregnancy and postpartum realm. Um, and a lot of pelvic pain, whether that's pelvic girdle yeah. pain or more what we consider vaginal pain. Right, right. So how would someone know that they are specific, like, okay, so do you, if someone's needing something for pregnancy or postpartum, should they seek out someone that's specifically trained in pelvic floor or pelvic health? Yes, because most of the time a straight ortho PT doesn't have the, the special training for that. Okay. So I would say anybody who is pregnant and is having any type of pelvic girdle concern, sciatica, mm -hmm. back pain, thoracic pain, neck pain, anything like that, instead of allowing someone to say, well, this will just get better after you deliver, yeah. why don't you just deal with it for the next 10 weeks. Mm -hmm. We really don't want that because we want people as active as yeah. possible yeah. throughout their entire pregnancies. And we know the medical benefits of that, mm -hmm. but also we want their strength yeah. exceptional to deliver well. So right. we want to get them to that birth. We also, during pregnancy, would love to see more people in looking at birth preparation. So, Talk about that, yeah. Yes. Wait, so, I, didn't know, I didn't even realize, see I'm learning so much. I didn't even realize you all can help with that. Yeah, yeah, we love talking about that. So if I get yeah. anybody in the clinic who yeah. is pregnant, we're always having those talks as we're working on them. So one of the kind of basic things that some people think about, have heard about before is perineal massage. And there actually is nice research backing that up with less sutures needed, less mm -hmm. tears, better recovery. Mm -hmm. So being able to prep that tissue is really nice. Yeah. And probably one of my favorite things to do is look at positioning. So our traditional delivery position we know is on the back, knees mm -hmm. up into our mm -hmm. elbows. Um, mm -hmm. And in that position, our pelvic floor is at full stretch. Mm -hmm. And then you are asking this baby's head to come down and out mm -hmm. the canal mm -hmm. and stretch three and a half times its yeah. normal length. Yeah. So are there some strategies to be able to try to make that floor a little more lax to help decrease the, the risk of tears? So uh, probably the two most common that we see with less tearing is on hands and knees, mm -hmm. because in that position, you've got a lot of weight going into the pubic bone. Mm -hmm. You don't have the legs, uh, the knees all the way up into your armpits. Mm -hmm pelvic floor is in a stretched. Mm -hmm. That position also is really lovely for somebody who has some pubic symphysis pain like that yeah. patient you were talking about. Mm -hmm. 
because their legs can't be stretched apart. Right. Those knees are grounded into the bed. Yeah. But the research really supports the very best ability to not tear being sidelined. So, mm -hmm. yeah. and somebody could be sidelined with an epidural yeah. or without yes. an epidural. Wait, and, I'm gonna, and, I'm gonna hop in for a second. Please. Just real quick, just as an OBGYN. Yeah. You know that, and I'm just gonna talk about this real briefly, but there's this common thought by people who are not in obstetric, you know, do not deliver babies or obstetricians that we want them on the back and, you know, pushing that way because it's easier for us. Right. That's not necessarily <laughs> true. Uh, you know, and, and we're trained that way. Yes, we're trained that way, but that's not the only way we're trained. Right. You know, we have to sometimes seek out learning how to deliver in, in different, when the patients are in the different positions. Right. But it doesn't mean we don't know. Um, one of the limiting factors, though, is the epidural. Some patients can get on hands and knees in epidural. Some can do side pushing in epidural, and then some can't. Mm. It's whether because it's not comfortable for them or because they don't feel enough or it just feels weird to them. But that is an option. I've done it a lot. Yeah. So I don't want anybody thinking that it, I'm not saying that all, there's not OBGYNs who would, who are going to poo poo that. Of course there are. Yeah, there are. But it's a, it's a conversation you can start having with your OBGYN earlier. You know, what are my options for pushing in different positions? Yeah. And then, you know, and I've done that too. And then some patients say, I want to go back on my back. So, you know, it's just having the willingness and openness to let them try different things. And I, and I said the word let purposely because that's how they perceive it when really it shouldn't be that way. It's what the patient wants or even suggesting it to them yeah. is empowering too. Hey, let's try this position. Let's try that position. And, but, you know, getting around and moving around and bouncing on the ball and some of that's going to be limited by the epidural, right? So I don't want anybody to think that uh, we're wanting you to push on your back because we just want to get in and out and run. That might, uh, that might happen in some cases, but most of us are open to doing exactly what you just said and yeah. the side pushing and the hands and knees. Uh, and it's just a matter of what is more comfortable for the patient. But uh, that's all. I just wanted to say that yeah. because it's important. Um, we get beat up quite a bit <laughs> about that, I think. Yes. And, uh, and I think probably rightfully so, but also at the same time, I think OBGYNs are much more open to things than we get credit for. Yeah. Well, yeah. definitely just making yeah. sure that people feel comfortable that they can yeah. advocate for themselves and ask, yes. is yes. this something that you're comfortable in yeah. doing it is great. So yeah. in the clinic, what we do is we use surface biofeedback where yeah. we hook them up to the pelvic floor and we have somebody practice gentle pushing, not a huge mm -hmm. Valsalva like you would mm -hmm. actually be yeah. doing in, in yeah. delivery, but making your belly big, making your belly hard, bearing down into your pelvic floor and seeing what position works really well for them. Mm -hmm. Is it squatting, which yeah. isn't as common in our yeah. population because we never squat, yeah. or is it sideline, or is it quadruped, yeah. or is it the yeah. traditional lithotomy yeah. position? Yeah. Um, and we really want to promote the position where they can keep their pelvic floor the most relaxed. So mm -hmm. it lengthens nicely to allow baby's head to come out. So, yeah. And then also teaching them where to focus their pressure, you know, where to focus pushing, you know, yeah. uh, I, sometimes, you know, I'm pushing with patients and they're pushing and it, it's like the baby's going to come out of their mouth. <laughs> it's all they're, they're like, and I'm like, that's not the baby's coming out of And you got to kind of guide them and show them. And I'm sure, you know, with your fingers, you get push on the perineum and the sidewalls to say, this is, do you feel that? That's where the pressure is. That's where you need to direct because you can waste a lot of energy all up in here with yeah. all that pushing when it needs to be, and there's nothing going on there. So it, you got to take time as a, as a obstetrical care provider to kind of assess them. Where are they putting their energy and direct them in the right spot? But going to someone for the public uh, floor therapist, you guys can start doing that before they even get to labor and delivery, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, we love really like, the last four yeah. to six weeks really looking yeah. at birth prep that way. That's awesome. So then you're asking other other things that we do. Yeah. So in our postpartum population, we really want anyone who's had a third or fourth degree tear, mm -hmm. anyone who's had a cesarean to be automatically referred to us. Um, you know, my bias standpoint is I think everybody should come, but mm -hmm. I know we would be completely overwhelmed. <laughs> is it, is it, so is it hard? Uh, is, are there insurance restrictions? Can Medicaid patients, 91% in, um, of my patients are Medicaid. Yeah. Can Medicaid patients go. Uh, what are the, uh, are there any barriers in that regard regarding insurance or do, yeah. do, do you have to have a referral? Those types of questions. Yeah. So I think uh, there are a lot of struggles there. Yeah. So starting with referral in all 50 states, 
people can come see a physical therapist without a physician referral for at least a limited amount of time. So here in Southern California, well, in all of California, we get 45 days or 12 visits. Mm -hmm. And if we feel like the patient needs longer than that, then we need something signed from a MD or a mm -hmm. uh, nurse practitioner or somebody in that realm, a PA. Mm -hmm. Um, now, some insurances won't pay for it, even though it's legal f through direct access, they're not going to pay for physical therapy unless there is a referral. So especially our Medicare population, which is usually our older population, but um, our federal payers, so the VA, uh, yeah. Medicaid, they will require a prescription. Okay. So that's kind of boundary number one is to be able to get a provider that understands the importance of uh, physical therapy and will write a referral. The other is access. And we've talked mm -hmm. about, you know, there aren't, there's maybe 4,000 of us in the U.S. There's mm -hmm. only about 600 of us that are board certified wow. in a specialty of women's health. <laughs> and in the private practice realm, a lot of people have moved to cash only practice, mm -hmm. which obviously limits the, yeah. uh, the population as well, which I don't love because I really feel like if mm. I had significant pelvic pain and I couldn't yeah. afford to come to PT weekly for the next three years, yeah. then I don't feel like I can run a clinic that is cash pay. So we are insurance based in Southern California. Now, that being said, Medicaid doesn't um, pay enough for us yeah. to be an active yep. provider for Medicaid. Mm -hmm. So for patients who are who have that type of insurance, sometimes there are hospital-based public health physical therapists. Oh, yes, yes. And so with those, you've got a much better chance of find, mm -hmm. finding somebody who will accept that insurance as well. Okay. Yeah. And I, I, I always say that OBGYN practices should have a list of places they would refer, you know, yeah. patients and they definitely need to put if anybody's listening, put pelvic floor, get know who's available in your area and what, what yeah. insurances they accept and don't accept, because that's a good resource to have um, to get to your patients. Um, okay, so let's start, let's go into, you know, you talk about pregnancy, just real quick. Go over some of the more, and you've touched on a little bit, some of the more common reasons why you see someone in pregnancy, uh, yeah. as far as uh, certain conditions that might have and what you can do to help. So the most common are, are pelvic girdle or low back pain patients. They may have sciatica coming down their leg. They're not able to stand as much, walk as much, maybe complete yeah. their work activities. So when they come in for an evaluation, we are looking at the pelvic girdle and deciding what's going on. Is it that we've had some of those ligamentous changes due to some hormone changes and the pelvis is just not quite, um, we don't like using the word unstable, um, but there's a little more motion there yeah. than we would like and they're not managing load well. So when they lift up their toddler, if they yeah. are lifting groceries or dog food or whatever it is, if we're not able to accept load into our core and regulate it well, oftentimes it's pushing down into our pelvic yeah. floor, which in our postpartum population causes leakage or prolapse, mm -hmm. but it also can just create a lot of, of pain problems. So mm -hmm. we're looking at, are there things in the joints that we can help improve? Are Is there just a lot of muscle tension because postures have changed, weight distribution yeah. has changed, Changed, center of gravity has changed. Um, so being able to help fix some of the, the posture related things and giving a lot of strengthening type exercises to be able to yeah. get them more functional and keep them that way all the way through delivery. So in, in that manner, we are kind of focusing on our patients more in an orthopedic way. Um, although a lot of your straight ortho PTs get very nervous touching pregnant patients. Pregnant patients, yeah. <laughs> so it's something that we're doing every day. Mm -hmm. And so how would someone know that what they're experiencing, you know, obviously we're going to go beyond, we're ruling out that there's anything else going on. You know, there's, it's not preterm labor. You're not having any bleeding. You're otherwise okay. Yeah. Um, and I just want to say here, uh, any OBGYNs or obstetrical care providers that are listening, and I've made posts about this, we have to stop telling people to just wait till you deliver, it'll get better. This is normal pregnancy. Yeah. You can tell when someone comes in and it's beyond being normal. 
I can tell. And it doesn't take 20 years of experience to figure that out. If someone's having to use something to walk into your office, if they're repeatedly telling you at every visit, it's not getting better, it's getting worse. It's now I can't work. Now I can't this. Or if they're asking you to take them off work at 20 weeks, it's not because they're lazy. It's probably because they're, there's something going on that they can't. And yeah. I, I found by and large that most patients don't want to come off work because they need to make that money. Yeah. They need to support their families. And it's not because they just want us to take them off work. It's probably because something's not allowing them to, to do their job because they're in too much pain. Yeah. So as obstetrical care providers, we have to be willing to stop saying that and realize that there's probably something else going on. And if we can't do something to make it better, at least get them to a pelvic floor of PT, somebody that can help them and assess them to see if it can get better. Because I've heard by and large, most people say it helped me within the first three to four to five visits. Yeah. And I started seeing improvement. And then you guys also teach them stuff that they can do once they get home to continue yes. the exercises at home. So it's not just you just get that one hour or 30 minutes. And that's it. You, you guys empower them and, and equip them to go home and continue doing those things. So uh, we have to be more open-minded about yeah. this. It's very much needed. Say, and it's better for your patient. Yeah. Kind of one point to that yeah. is yeah. when we're thinking about back pain and kind of that yeah. traditional, oh, it'll get better after you deliver. What we see in the literature is that 25% of people with back pain develop persistent back pain yeah. postpartum that does not mm -hmm. just automatically go away. So, yeah. so much better just to address that. And mama is going to mm -hmm. be much better at being yeah. a strong participant in labor than yeah. not. Yes. So let's yeah. keep them as active as possible. And, and then explain real quick some of the things that a, someone listening might be experiencing that could be an indication that there is a pelvic floor or pelvic girdle issue going on that might benefit from seeing someone like yourself. Yeah. So I'm going to grab my pelvic okay. model here. Yes. So mm -hmm. if we're thinking about the pelvis itself, if people have pain right in the middle, in the front at what we call the pubic symphysis, and I think that patient you were talking about at the very beginning. Yes probably was having this. Yes. If somebody's really struggling walking, this is usually uh, the problem. So you can see here on this pelvis that the pubes here are pretty close together. They spread somewhat during pregnancy and then they spread even further during delivery to be able to mm -hmm. help that pelvic outlet yes. open more. So if they're spread and maybe the pelvis is a little bit loosey goosey and it's getting pulled, there are all these ligaments and things here that could create pain. So one is pain right in the front there, pain in the groin or the front of the hip joint. In the back of the pelvis, people mm -hmm. will just point right to that bone mm -hmm. where the pelvic rim attaches onto our mm -hmm. tailbone and um, sacrum here. So if you can go right there in my low back, that's really bugging me. That's an indication. If there's pain that comes down into the bum and even mm -hmm. down into the leg, yeah. that is a huge indication. And then anything up in here into mm -hmm. the low back as well mm -hmm. would be people who are really great candidates for coming in. Or if they've yeah, got I, toddlers or you yeah. know, job requirements that they're not able to do for some mm -hmm. reason or another, they would be great to send in as well. Yeah. Okay, so let's move on to some postpartum stuff. Do you mostly see patients in the postpartum period or mostly in pregnancy or it's kind of equal? We see more postpartum, but like there was a gal I worked with yesterday who's 45, mm -hmm. who had a baby at 18 and a baby at 19, and she still has stress incontinence, frequency, mm -hmm. um, lack of sexual appreciation, mm -hmm gas control problems mm -hmm. like she should have seen us two decades ago oh, and yeah. not 45 so yeah. that's just you know one of many 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 cases we see mm -hmm. where we're not necessarily getting them timely postpartum and women think oh well that's normal you yeah. know my aunt had yeah. that or my grandma had to have yeah. surgery because her bladder was falling out or you know no everybody leaks after having babies. I mean it's, all, it's almost like we are supposed to expect our bodies to break down after we give birth. Yes. So, you know, and listen, to a certain degree, they will. Yeah. I mean, we're going to be uncomfortable and we're going to have some sequelae from giving birth, but it should be limited and temporary. It shouldn't keep persisting, persisting, and persisting. The you know, the body's an amazing thing, especially in pregnancy and postpartum. I mean, our body goes through incredible things and it, it can, you know, get back to normal and come, things can go back to normal to a certain degree. But if, if it's yeah. not there's a problem. You yeah. shouldn't still be suffering the consequences of delivering weeks and years later. Right. 
Right. And yeah. I mean, somebody has a little knee surgery or a little shoulder mm -hmm. surgery, and they are referred to physical therapy three yes, times yes, a week yes. for six weeks and across I'll the board. My fingertip. <laughs> <laughs> right? I mean, I'll probably get it. I'm serious. I'll probably get physical therapy. Yeah. Because my fingers fuse right now. I will. Oh. And I probably should. I'm a surgeon. I, I probably should. Exactly. So you why need would that we not do motor control someone, back. Yeah, for someone who pushed a human out of their body. <laughs> right? Yeah. Exactly. You yeah. Really like birth or, a human. I yes. you really deserve a yeah. little or, bit and, of and, uh, and I just say just not which is vaginal delivery, but also cesarean. I mean, I had a cesarean I had some sequelae too. So people that still have pelvic cord dysfunction and have never had a vaginal delivery. So I just wanted right. that out there. That's true. So so let's talk first about urinary, you touched on a little bit, urinary incontinence in the postpartum period. Yes. Um, when is it not normal? When should they see you? What can you do? Okay, so it is never normal. <laughs> Common, but it's never common. normal. So mm -hmm. if someone is leaking at three months postpartum, mm -hmm. they should be seen. Yeah. That yeah. if they had some temporary leakage because their pelvic floor was so lengthened, they had a fourth degree yeah. tear, or something else yeah. was happening, yeah. then we want to respect some of that uh, recovery time, healing time, but it, it really shouldn't be past 12 weeks. And mm -hmm. if somebody has significant leakage, then it impacts their exercise ability, yeah. Yeah. they start limiting that sort of thing. So what we see is at least a third of women in the United States leak. Mm -hmm. And a majority of them are coming from pregnancy and especially those who had a vaginal birth. Yeah. So one of the other really scary stats is that the number one reason that women are put in nursing homes is urinary incontinence. Mm -hmm. So why on earth yeah. are we letting women leak for yeah. decades yeah. when it's just going to then continue and maybe lead to some other sequelae like yeah. prolapse or fecal yeah. incontinence? And yeah. so it's just this <laughs> vicious cycle that we really yeah. would love to be able to help resolve quickly after yes. pregnancy in that first year and not be seeing people two decades after. Right. And you also touched on pelvic organ prolapse. I Pelvic organ prolapse is, is essentially where the, you know, the cervix can actually pro prolapse into the vagina and come down into the vagina. Also where the bladder is could start to droop or where the, the uh, rectum is can start to bulge into the vagina as well. And you typically think that someone with pelvic or organ prolapse is going to have had multiple babies, uh, has had multiple vaginal births, a big baby here or there. Those are the most people that you see with pelvic organ prolapse. But it was about a year ago. I had an 18 year old, yeah, 18 who had her second baby, two vaginal deliveries, and they weren't huge babies, who had severe pelvic organ prolapse. Severe. So it can happen to anyone. It can happen after one birth. It can happen after two. It can happen after 10. Every individual is different. The fact is that if it's there, it needs to be addressed. So do you guys step in um, before a surgical, before they go to surgery? Like, is there, are there things you can do to try to help to, uh, either prevent having to go to surgery. Is that where you guys come in? Yes. And yeah. please, please, please sign us up for that. Yeah. We are yeah. always ready for that. Yeah. So when you look at the research, they grade prolapse yes. on a zero to four scale, which you know. Okay. Um, grade one, two, and three are shown to improve with consistent pelvic floor physical okay. therapy. Mm -hmm. Now that looks like 16 to 20 weeks of consistent mm -hmm. care. But what we see is the two most common symptoms, which is the pelvic heaviness, kind of like you've mm -hmm. got a, a tampon half in and it's yes. falling out. Yes. The heaviness resolves and what we call a post void dribble. So yes. you think you're done peeing, you go to stand up and a couple drops mm -hmm. come out either on the toilet seat or on your underwear. Mm -hmm. Both of those are just huge signs of prolapse, especially bladder prolapse. Mm -hmm. So the literature also supports that prolapse can lift a grade with consistent um, therapy. Mm -hmm. So we are looking at being able to strengthen from below, but one of those things that I mentioned about um, low transferability yeah. that is really huge so can I do a little demo yeah, sure. okay all right so we have our pelvis our vulva mm -hmm. puppet here so normally at the opening of the vagina we wouldn't see a lot of tissue yeah. but if I shove in 
this is actually a little breast squish ball mm -hmm. that stress ball that we uh, use mm -hmm. for clogged duct education mm -hmm. but somebody might see this is yeah. a little more significant this would be a grade two plus to three prolapse where the tissue is being pushed mm -hmm. outside the vaginal opening so this is what somebody could look for if they were looking in a mirror yeah. before exercise yes, yeah. after exercise seeing that if there's a change but what we have to be able to manage is not just strengthening here, but if we think about the way that the vulva is positioned, if the belly isn't strong and mm -hmm. somebody's yes. having problems with diastasis or just truly just core control or constipation, let's throw constipation mm -hmm. in there, then what happens is you just keep getting this bulging yeah, yeah. down below every time mm -hmm. you lift a bag of groceries and go to the bathroom and you know walk yeah. your dog. And if you can't get that load transferability under control, mm -hmm. it's really hard to get a prolapse under control. So mm -hmm. you could do a million trillion Kegels, but that's usually not enough. Yeah. Um, and just to throw it out there, you know, we think of most of our postpartum pelvic floor challenges coming from weakness or mm -hmm. laxity, but it always has to be mentioned that we actually could be overactive. So mm -hmm. the pelvic floor could be a little more in spasm. Mm -hmm. And then when you cough and sneeze, you might leak because the muscle's mm -hmm. too tight to be mm -hmm. able to work quickly to kind of clamp your organ shut. But same thing with prolapse. It just gets too bloody fatigued and can't mm. hold everything up and we get a little more descent. So I don't want people to think, oh, well, I'm leaking urine. I should just start 200 kegels a day because it's just better to be able to have some sort of assessment mm. of is this truly weakness or is this more an overactive muscle that needs to be released first? So kegels don't cure everything then? They do not cure. I wish they cured everything. <laughs> they're so simple to do. <laughs> I know, but, you know, somebody's yeah, going to read Cosmo yeah. and go home and start yeah. doing 200 kegels yeah. a day, and they're going to over fatigue. It's like when yeah, you go to yeah. the gym and pick up a 20 pound weight and do 200 bicep curls. Yeah, yeah. You wouldn't be able to lift your arm the next day. So, I mean, it needs to be said that there is such a thing as either doing them when they're not really indicated because it's not going to help what the actual issue is, right. or it can make it worse. So, you know, before you start going and doing those, like, like, like you said, 200 kegels a day, yeah. make sure you know if, if that's the right thing to be doing, right? right? Cause it could be so that it's something else that's needed. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, now my favorite, and mm. I get a, probably a dozen questions a month about this is okay. diastasis. Yeah. You, you touched about that, you know, um, diastasis happens uh, with pregnancy, especially the more pregnancies you have, especially if in between pregnancies, we're not doing anything to build our core back up. Yes. Uh, you know, pregnancies back to back can increase the risk. There's this also thought that having C-sections is going to increase your, the diastasis. It it's, doesn't really. I yeah. mean, if you've had multiple C-sections where you had to go in there and I've seen, and uh, we get a lot of patients who have had multiple C-sections from other countries and I come in, they have no rectus left. It's just completely obliterated by the time I get to them and there's really nothing you can do. And, and, and just while we're on it also is that, yes, we separate the rectus muscles when we do a C-section and everybody's like, why can't you just put them back together? Well, they're muscles. And if I, I start putting stitches in them and you move the wrong way or that stitch rips and you tear that rectus muscle, you can get a big hematoma. So right. putting in stitches is not the option either. The best thing you can do is have a good core before you get pregnant, keep doing it while you're pregnant and then build it back up after you deliver, right? Right. So where can you guys fall? And then if, if something happens and you don't, and sometimes even if you do all that, you still can get it for whatever reason. How can you guys help with, with the diastasis? And when does somebody need help with the diastasis? Yeah. So what the research shows is if you have one still at 12 weeks mm -hmm. postpartum, mm -hmm. you're probably going to have it five years later. So mm -hmm. what when you think about the rectus abdominis being the two long six pack muscles um, in mm -hmm. the front of your belly, there is always a divot between them. Yeah. So there's a connective tissue called the linea alba. And that is normal. There should be a divot <laughs> there. Mm -hmm. yeah. Your muscles aren't hooked to together right. mm -hmm. and again which makes repairs harder right because yeah. they just they don't live yeah. that way so there's always a divot during pregnancy as they get those muscles get longer 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 they finally go okay i'm done like somebody mm -hmm. else do some stretching and we're going to separate almost everyone gets a diastasis during pregnancy yeah so 
what we are looking for is how wide is that separation now postpartum? So two finger widths or smaller is what we consider the normal. But in the last decade, there's just been a ton of discussion of, do we really care how wide it is? Um, mm. What we really care about is how deep is it? Mm. If it is three finger widths wide, but it's really shallow and firm and it feels like a trampoline and somebody can go through the load transfer test that we do just beautifully, we don't really care. I mean, it would be nice for the look of it for them to come back in, but mm -hmm. we really are looking at functionally, how mm -hmm. does this work? Um, and is it really important that we close the gap as mm -hmm. they call it and bring that all the way back together? So in a perfect world, we get it back to two finger widths, but really looking at shallow and firm. Mm -hmm. And so when somebody curls up into a crunch, there's no tenting where kind of all the tissue blows through that opening and there's no depth or bogginess mm -hmm. really mm -hmm. down deep as well. So we really look at strengthening the deepest pelvic floor, or sorry, the deepest abdominal muscle the most at the beginning when you're doing diastasis recovery, because that muscle comes across the belly and mm -hmm. it interdigitates through the back of the rectus. So yep. the stronger that transversus is, it pulls everything down. But the transversus is a automated muscle. So before you cough, before you lift your leg, before you lift groceries, your transverse abdominus is ahead of you by about an eighth of a second and it contracts. It supports your core, it protects your back, it does all those things. But then we live through a pregnancy and those muscles get so over lengthened, very often we lose our automation. Oh. So when that happens, we need to go back down to mm -hmm. these super subtle tedious, boring exercises to really get that muscle brain connection yeah. going again, because it's really about like, where is that transverse abdominus firing in the brain, yeah. in the motor cortex? So it's much more about subtlety mm -hmm. and coordination than it is about mm -hmm. brute strength. Mm -hmm. So doing a million crunches aren't yeah. isn't really kind of the best yeah. thing. You've got to get the deep, subtle stuff first and then layer on harder and harder exercises using all the other core muscles as well. Yeah, so that's yeah. usually what we're working with patients on is working through those progressions as they're able to get kind of one level of mm -hmm. rehab really perfectly and then mm -hmm. moving on into the harder and harder levels. Yeah, and then also working on the core muscle, the muscles. And there's, and just like you mentioned, Sorry, it's a fly in my, in my office. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you have the rectus muscles, and everybody just always thinks about the rectus muscles, but you have the transverse abdominis, you have the obliques, you have a whole gamut of muscles in the, in, that's involved in the core that are all, all have a role in helping to support your core, which having a strong core helps your back, helps your pelvis, because it's all intertwined. And yeah. if you have one piece of that puzzle that's not functioning properly, it could cause an issue with all the other pieces in the puzzle. Yeah. I learned that firsthand. You know, I was in the hospital for two months and my core and my back was just completely destroyed. And, yeah. you know, and I suffered for it for a long time. So, you know, I get it. We just have to understand that, you know, our back is connected, you know, our abdomen is connected to our back, is connected to our pelvis, is connected to our hips, is connected to all of everything. Uh, yeah. What's happening in our pelvic floor, it's all connected. And we have to, especially after a pregnancy, make sure we get that back in as, as best shape as we can um, before we have that next pregnancy. So, exactly. You know, I, I think, uh, and we're going we're to tackle this question at the end of the conversation about whether it should be pelvic floor PT should be part of routine postpartum care. Obviously, the answer is going to be yes, and we'll discuss yeah. why. But that's <laughs> just one of the reasons why, obviously, one of the reasons why. Yes. Um, talk briefly about, and I hear, hear a lot about this now, uh, C-section scar pain. Um, from an OB perspective, I'll tell you one thing about C-section scar. Like, my C-section scar is still numb. I don't know why. What people can find is that they have no issues after they have their C-section. Obviously, the more times you've had a C-section through that same scar, the more issues you're going to have with scar tissue, with nerve pain, because you go mm -hmm. through those nerves enough, they're not going to come back together right. So, uh, and then adhesions, the adhesions going for all the way from the skin, all the way inside, they can all get connected together and cause an issue the more C-sections you have. But even after one, you can have some scar tissue pain. You can have some numbness. You can have some nerve pain. Um, and it could take while, a while. Mine's been five years and it's still numb. 
I've, yeah. I've had patients that's had it still, you know, it's still painful after a, a few years. So what can you guys do for someone that's having persistent scar tissue pain? Yeah. Oh, sorry, well, the cesarean scar pain. Cesarean yeah. Scar well, the good pain. news is any scar can improve for 20 years. Yeah. So that is really helpful. But we kind of think about a scar being like you would feel the seam of your shirt mm -hmm. and how that's a little bit thickened compared yeah. to other tissue. And also think about... Um, a toddler kind of pulling mm -hmm. on yeah. your shirt constantly mm -hmm. and that's kind of what a scar is doing it just keeps yanking on these other mm -hmm. tissues it can be this 3d thing here so it can cause a lot of other problems um so we assess the mobility of scars if they already are really adhered and ad adhesions start by six weeks so you really want to get your hands on that scar before six weeks mm -hmm. but another point to our when should people be seeing a maternal care mm -hmm. provider postpartum is it should be way before six weeks yeah. um, or they need to be educated during pregnancy. This is how you do scar massage. This right. is when you should start it. So oftentimes people are really fearful to touch their scars yeah. and specifically looking at the C-section scars, people kind of want to ignore it. It's like mm -hmm. they never look down there anymore. Mm -hmm. They kind of have just crossed that area off that no longer mm -hmm. lives on my body. Um, so it's hard to touch them. Yeah. And my third baby was breached and I ended up in a C-section with her. And that was really challenging for me even to get my hands on that. Mm -hmm. But we need to be gently nudging that scar and sweet talking it into moving nicely, starting between two to three weeks postpartum. Okay. So that could be a perineal tear or mm -hmm. a C-section. Yeah scar. And in general, if you just kind of put your hand over the incision, you can start very easily just with some little circles coming mm -hmm. in, coming up and holding, coming down and holding. One of the things we don't want is that uh, thing that so many women describe as kind of that shelf where mm -hmm. the scar is stuck and then the skin hangs over. Yeah. Like nobody wants that. Yeah. That scar yeah. should be able to move up and down move, yeah. side to side. Now you start that at three weeks, you do it a couple times a day, four or five minutes, really gentle. You don't wanna to go to the point of pain, but you're just nudging that tissue mm -hmm. because we know when we get cut through, the collagen lays down wherever the heck it wants, yeah. very haphazardly. Mm -hmm. And we wanna just nudge it and say, no, we really want you to line up. We don't want uh, like saran wrap on saran wrap. You know how sticky that yes, is. Yes, yes. There's, uh -huh. you know, you tear it before you actually can get it to glide. We want saran wrap with olive oil in between and it to be that smoothly moving. Mm -hmm. So it is much easier to preventively work on any type of incision or tear to not ever get to the adhesion point than it is to get adhesions moving better if we yes. wait too long. So yeah, yeah. we can work on either of those things, but we'll do a lot of manual techniques in the clinic. We will teach people how to yeah. do some of those things as well. And especially for C-section scars, got my cup sitting right over mm -hmm. there. There are some massage tools um, called cups Mm -hmm. where you put them on and they suction up the tissue. Yes, You've yes. got to put a lot of massage cream on and then you gently rub mm -hmm. up and over the scar. Mm -hmm. For those, you want to wait more like 10 to 12 weeks. You need mm -hmm. full tensile strength for the tissue to allow you to pull it up. But we mm -hmm. need that. Like we always think about down or moving side to side, but we have a lot less of the up. So mm -hmm. we want that to be happening as well. So we can teach people how to skin roll it or using cups at home is a really easy, cheap technique. You can, you know, get them off Amazon. They'll be there within yeah. two days and Excellent. use them at home. Okay. And then what about for someone who's had a, a vaginal laceration or obstetrical laceration? What yep. can you guys do for that? So same thing, we are doing yeah. more internal work on the muscles, working on the scars, teaching people how to also do that at home, because mm -hmm. just doing it once a week with us is probably not going to be enough. You want to be um, doing it a little more often, another couple days yes. a week at home. So we teach people how to do it, or we teach partners how to help. Also, vibrators are really great mm -hmm. for scars because vibration covers up pain. They run on those okay. same A delta and C fibers. So somebody can put the vibrator onto a really tender spot and then turn on the vibration and massage mm. around it two, three minutes. And that hello and oxygen.
and then helps mm-hmm. everything heal nicely as well. And when can they start doing that in the postpartum period? Three weeks. When is it? Three weeks. Okay. Yeah. Does it depend on how bad the tear was? A third or fourth degree tear, I probably would wait a little bit longer. It's kind of that that fine line because you don't want adhesions. You really want that yeah. to move. But with them, they could start more some pelvic floor contractions, yes. which is going to naturally pull on the scar a little bit and help the collagen lay down properly yeah. as well. Yeah, and and, and I just did a, a short video about this the, the other day about the importance of if you do have an obstetrical laceration after a vaginal delivery, you need to know exactly where you tore, how bad the tear was. Yes. Uh, because you, there's so many, it's, there's so many places I've seen people tear after a vaginal delivery that I never thought they could tear. I mean, I, I, I've been doing this for 20 years. I've seen just about everything, but it can happen. You need to know exactly where you tore, what the consequences are for future deliveries. If there's any special considerations for the recovery in a postpartum period, Everybody wants to know how many stitches we had. We don't really do individual stitches. We just keep putting a suture and we run. We do layers. So it's not even that. It's about, you know, what kind of tear you had, first degree, second degree, and there's different variations of a third degree and then a fourth degree, whether it's a sulcal tear, uh, which I won't go into that, but that's a whole another type of tear that's in their, your vaginal vault. Um, you know, we can have them all the way up to the issue rectal fat pad, which can even expose into the pelvis. Yeah. Uh, the labia majora, minora, the perineal tears, all of those tears, especially when you get to the surface where the introitus is or the opening of the vagina is, that can contribute also to painful intercourse. Mm-hmm. So knowing where you tore, so when you go see uh, a pelvic floor PT, you could say, this is where I tore. They may might likely be able to tell if they're doing an yeah. exam, but just so you know, so they know where to, where to uh, uh, you know, do the, do the work, but it's important for you to know, you need to know where you tore and it's okay to ask if anybody gives you crap for asking that's on them, not you. It's your body. You should be able, you should know exactly where they're repairing. Yeah. Okay. I, that drives me crazy when yeah, people I know. don't know, because as you talked about a third or fourth degree tear has yeah. some other implications yes, and often if somebody actually is doing beautifully postpartum with a third or fourth degree tear, when we see them in the clinic, it is more perimenopause, menopause time. Mm. So the tissue okay. is thinning and yes. now we're starting to see some fecal incontinence or fecal okay. smearing with activity. And gotcha, gotcha. so those patients, I, they need to be educated about how important mm. it is to keep yeah. that strength up as we age so they mm-hmm. don't end up back in our clinics gotcha. going through menopause when mm-hmm. these other things finally present themselves okay can all since we touched on it can all pelvic floor physical therapists do a vaginal exam or an internal exam or rectal exam they should so they in should our level to... one courses we teach internal vaginal exams and muscle mapping so you should be able to know are you on the bulba cavernosis or the pubic oxygeus okay. or even we do obturator internus and mm-hmm. kind of any of those muscles that come in and connect right. um we look at pubic oxygeus um, abruptions as well mm-hmm. on the being able to look and see, do we think that that muscle has pulled off the back of the pubic bone a bit? Mm-hmm. Um, that is more in our advanced pelvic floor uh, vulvar cases. And then people don't have to take the colorectal side, which teaches rectal exams. Mm-hmm. I, being biased about it, I think you can't treat everything we need to treat yeah, unless you can't also do it, yeah. can assess rectally. And those courses teach us more about constipation, fecal incontinence. Mm-hmm. Um, we bring in our, our male counterparts where we're mm-hmm. looking at male anatomy and male pain and male incontinence mm-hmm. as well. Um, pedendal neuralgia, some of those higher level um, things. So it depends on how far people are through their training, but even level one, they should be very competent doing internal muscle exams and prolapse. We do prolapse in level one. This, uh, this is a question. This, it wasn't in our outline. We always exchange before we do these conversations. Yeah. But I was asked about this recently. Do you guys do any kind of work with someone who's had trauma, who is concerned about having a vaginal delivery and exams and helping to I mean, what, can you help someone and what can you do? I mean, I think it's an important thing to ask because uh, there are patients who have had trauma and childbirth exams are extremely traumatizing and triggering and stressful for them. What can a pelvic floor uh, specialist PT do to help them in that situation? 
so in our level one courses, we are really looking at like Penny Simpkins work on when survivors mm -hmm. give birth. Mm -hmm. And that's all about people who have survived some sort of sexual trauma in their history. Although she does delve a little bit about the trauma being a previous childbirth as mm -hmm. well. So we definitely work on that, we are taught mm -hmm. a lot about trauma-informed care okay. and are very particular about our wording choices. So okay. it, depending on the PT's comfort and mm -hmm. being able to have some of those conversations, um, we see a lot of, uh, kind of on the flip side, but fear of penetration. Yes. Um, so we are dealing a lot with cognitive behavioral therapy mm -hmm. and techniques, trying to reframe the fear and mm -hmm. turning it more into a challenge. Mm -hmm. But I'd say somebody who has a extensive background of trauma in their life, we want to be working with our mental health colleagues yes. um, to be able to work as a team, to be able mm -hmm. to have a, a goal like that. But mm -hmm. I mean, my very first pelvic pain patient was less trauma, more fear, mm -hmm. had never been able to have penetration, had been married mm -hmm. eight years. Mm -hmm. So had never consummated their marriage, had never had a pap smear because she couldn't tolerate a speculum. And that took us a while. It was about six months of treatment, but she was able to have penetration pain-free. Wow. She got a little plastic speculum, brought it in. We practiced with that until she was ready to then go to her provider. Because by then mm -hmm. she had a lot of trust in me. And so we needed to get kind of that, being able to tolerate a speculum mm -hmm. well mm -hmm. under her belt and then being able to send her on there. So yeah. it is something that we discuss and good. try to be very sensitive about. Good, good, good. Yeah, I could see it definitely how that could definitely help in those situations. And, you know, so for any OB, OBs who are listening, if you have a patient that you know uh, has that history and is, you know, we got to ask them too. It's okay to talk about. I mean, we're their providers and we need to know uh, what they're, you know, if they're thinking about that or worried about it or stressed about the birth process. And if that's the case, then we should send them obviously in conjunction with the mental health specialist to someone who can help with the, you know, uh, some physical therapy type uh, exercises and, and things that they could do to help, um, you know, but we're not going to know unless we ask. And I know it's sometimes it can be uncomfortable for an obstetrician to ask about things like that, even if we know they have a, a history, but we can't assume that they're going to be okay with everything just because they didn't bring it up. Sometimes we just have to open that door and have that discussion with them. It's yeah. important. Okay, so last question. Should the pelvic floor PT be part of routine pregnancy and postpartum care? Yeah, of course. <laughs> <laughs> you knew I was going to say that, though. Yes, I did. Um, yeah. I, I do think there are just so many changes, yeah. whether it is the muscle lengthening, it's our postural changes, it's our automation of how our core works, yeah. like all those things really could benefit. In France, every woman who delivers gets 10 visits of physical therapy, no matter what. Oh. If they've birthed a child, they uh, get physical therapy. And I remember in the last two years, probably, I had a gal who was a, being a surrogate for mm -hmm. a friend who was from, who was French. And she emailed and was like, why isn't this a thing? <laughs> I couldn't tell you because I am a huge advocate for it. And a lot of other countries are doing that. And some countries yes. are even doing more birth prep, starting like 26, mm -hmm. 28 weeks, mm -hmm. sending people in to get ready for mm -hmm. delivery as well. So even if we could just get them for six visits like that yeah. would be amazing to be able to really address these things but somewhere in a mom's education needs to be if this happens it is not normal and it can be addressed yeah. if this happens it is not normal it can be addressed because it's just society really pushes it that all of this is normal isn't it funny yeah. when somebody leaks when yeah. they laugh or jump and mm -hmm. that's just not okay yeah it's not normal you know with social media we see a lot and I get the humor in it. I do. But it's not humorous to the person that's watching the video that probably is going through it. And it's not normal. And that's the kind of the, the line it toes. Is it is it meant to be funny or is it trying to say, oh, well, everybody has it, so it's funny. It's not normal. You don't have to live that way. There are things that can be done. And, you know, we don't have to give up our bodies for the sake of having kids. Um, yes, we go through a lot and our bodies are built to withstand a lot. The, the pregnant body is amazing and the whole physiological process and everything we go through is incredible. What a pregnant person is designed to tolerate, to be honest with you, it's still, it's amazing to me to this day. But that doesn't mean that we have to live after we give birth 
with the consequences of it, uh, we yeah. can have a quality of life. We don't have to have incontinence. We don't have to have chronic pain. Um, we can talk about it. We can ask and we can expect to have someone that was going to advocate for us and get us the help that we need. Yeah. You know, if you're feeling dismissed, go to someone that's going to listen to you. And that's why I feel like it's just so much brushed under the rug. Like when you mm -hmm. had kids, what do you expect? Yeah. Ugh. If I had a pity right? for every time I heard that. Right? I mean, I just don't understand. That mentality needs to change. It really does because it's not fair and it's not appropriate and it's, it's just kind of dismissive. Well, it is dismissive. It's very dismissive. Yeah. So if you're watching this and you're going through these things and you're afraid or embarrassed to talk about it, don't be. You know, uh, there's somebody that's going to listen to you and help you get help and, you know, look for out. How can people find pelvic floor PTs? Like how is there a certain date uh, registry or is there, like how would someone go about looking for someone in their city per se? Yeah. So yeah. there are two main nationwide, at least for the people in the U.S. listening here, um, websites that you can go to. One is www.hermanwallace.com. And that actually is the group that I teach nationwide mm -hmm. courses through. And they have a find a provider button and you can put in mm -hmm. your zip code and find whoever is closest to you who has gone through their trainings. Um, the APTA, so the American Physical Therapy Association, also has a pelvic health section. So that would be aptapelvichealth.org. And same thing, they'll be able to have a find a provider button where you can look up your state and try to find somebody close to you as well. Do you have any kind, do you have any kind of courses on your website or anything that's available that people can, yeah, what do you have available? So um, in Southern California, my clinic is called Women's Advantage Physical Therapy. And so we're in Torrance and Long Beach, which is just south of Los Angeles. So if somebody's looking for in-person care, um, we have 10 providers and all of us, it's all we do is public mm -hmm. health. If you are somewhere, like right now I'm working with a gal from West Virginia and mm -hmm. there's nobody anywhere close yeah, no. to her that has mm -hmm. been trained to do any of this type of work. So I do have a 12 week postpartum online recovery course. Mm -hmm. And if people are interested in learning about it, they can either send me a DM over um, at Empowered Mamas Thrive and I can send you a registration link for, I've got a free masterclass on on the four-step framework to recovering from pregnancy mm -hmm. and kind of all the things that I think are the most important mm -hmm. things that we need to know and kind of commit to mm -hmm. because what we see is there are 8,000 books on how to breastfeed and how to care for your yes. child yeah. and how to get them to sleep and you know all of those things mm -hmm. but as soon as we deliver there's nothing about yeah. us it's like yeah. pregnancy how should you eat and you know all mm -hmm. those things but there's just that huge lack of support and mm -hmm. kind of expert guidance that is research-based for the postpartum period. Mm -hmm. So yeah. if people are interested, shoot me a DM and I will um, send you the registration link for the master yeah, and, and then I'll that tells the, a bit about the course. I'll put your information in the caption under this video on my feed Great. so you can get to uh, uh, Jenny's Instagram account and go, is it in your link and buy like uh, your, in your uh, profile on your Instagram? Yes, I can add it in to make it yeah. come up. Yeah, correctly. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, we're gonna. There's not. I don't think there's a whole lot of questions I was watching, so I went ahead and used it full time. Uh, awesome. So we're gonna get shut off here in a few minutes. But I want to thank you so much for your time. This is very, very good. Of I think course. it's a great representation of what pelvic floor PTs can do. Um, there's so much you guys can do, and mm -hmm. I'm here to advocate for pelvic floor PT for everyone. And um, I know there's not a lot of you guys, but also if anybody's listening, that's going the PT route, this is an option for you to um, specialize in because it's very, very much, you're going to have patience, always have patience. Anything that has to do with babies and delivering, you're going to always have patience, right? So yeah. Go for uh, it, I, you know? <laughs> teaching our level one course is my favorite of all the yeah. courses I teach because yeah. people come in kind of deer in the headlights yeah. and maybe somebody was going on maternity leave and they're kind of being strongly encouraged to go take this course and everybody doesn't know what to expect with vaginal yeah. exams. And my goal by the end is to really get it to click for them and to have Good. them fall in love with pelvic health yeah. because it really is a, we need more specialists. Um, yes, we do. You said there's only 4,000 in the state and the country, I mean? In the U.S. Mm -hmm. in the, that's crazy. Yeah, yeah, that's not enough. 
No, <laughs> that's not enough. Okay, okay, well, thank you so much for your time. Have a great rest of your day, Jenny. You're welcome. Don't follow Jenny Gablesburg at, Emp at Empowered Mamas Thrive on Instagram. Go to the caption under this video and get uh, some more information um, that we talked about here. And thank you so much. And you can, if you have any questions for her, you can also shoot her a DM on Instagram, right? Yeah, of course, All right. anytime. All right. I thank you so much. Oh, it's my pleasure. <laughs> bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye.